Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of CCHE's Climate Conversations. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, my name is Mitzi Chanel Tan, and I'll be hosting our conversation today. As a climate justice activist, today's subject is very close to my heart, and I have the absolute pleasure of discussing it with two titans of the environmental field, writer and environmental activist George Monbayo, and CCAG member Professor Johan Rockström, director of the post Institute for Climate Impact Research. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Just Thank days you. ago, yeah, exactly. It's so good to be together, especially when just days ago, the IPCC released its latest report on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, giving yet again another urgent reminder that the climate crisis impacts we're seeing now will get worse with continuous inaction from world leaders. But the worst effects of climate change are not impacting us equally. Rather, this emergency is dividing the world between those with money, tools, and resources to survive, and quite simply, those without. And if we don't act now and take vital steps in favor of climate justice, these divisions will only get worse, soon becoming unmanageable for poorer, more vulnerable nations. So my first question for the both of you is, given the report and how big it is and, and how important it is, what are your key takeaways? Yeah, so, so thanks, Ms. So I've been, you know, working with this around the clock over the last, I mean, actively over at least two decades and then followed at least four IPCC reports. And, and leading institutes that really contribute the science into these reports. But I must admit that even I, when reading the summary of the Working Group 2 report on, on impacts and equity and damage, I got quite, quite, you know, taken myself that when you put all the evidence together in one place, e even someone like myself working every day and night on this get, get quite shocked. And the language of the IPCC has never been sharper. You know, the high level message is that Climate change already today is threatening human well-being and the stability of the planet. And, and even the least minor delay at this point will close the window for our future as humanity on Earth. I mean, that is very powerful language for a science assessment, which is the minimum common denominator across the entire world community. And this is the first time, uh, as far as I can remember at least that the IPCC starts talking about billions affected. It's not millions. We're talking about 3 billion people already living in vulnerable regions to climate change. We're talking about, you know, coastal zones and salinization and storms due to sea level rise and intensified storms affecting billions across coastal areas. And health, health impacting, you know, in just 30, 40 years time, billion people just, just with dengue fever moving northwards in the planet because of warming. So it's really dire scientific reading from, from the, you know, from the basic scientific source, the IPCC. I, I, I completely um, concur with that. I mean, it's, it's, it makes very grim and depressing reading. And it, it's, it's especially cruel, really, that this comes out right in just after the Russian invasion of Ukraine has started and just gets swept off the, the headlines. Hardly anybody even knows that it's been published. It was, we were looking to it as being a great publishing event around which we could renew our call for urgent international action, but understandably because, you know, we have another massive event which um, has uh, captured the entire world's attention yet again it gets bumped down the agenda and yet again it's very hard to get almost anyone to focus on it and Johan will find this very familiar but I feel like this has been my whole life that you know these dire warnings existential warnings are produced by the world's top scientists either individually or together as with the IPCC reports and there's always something else on the agenda now you know in this case it is understandable you know this the, the war is huge um, but in, in most of the time the something else is actually far 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 more trivial than what the IPCC and others have have, have been demonstrating because ultimately this is the biggest issue of all. It's bigger even than war. It will affect far more people even than war, unless the, 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 the war goes nuclear. 
and yet somehow it's just not there where it should be. It always is the Cinderella subject. It always takes second place to, or third place or 100th place to everything else. It gets just as in um, uh, the, the, so brilliantly satirized in, in the film Don't Look Up, where you know some trivial celebrity nonsense um, displaces it and uh, and you know this the the potential um, destruction of all life on earth by the meteorite sort of comes bottom of the news agenda um, and it really does feel like that um, and that film I think has resonated massively for people who've been involved in this issue because yeah that's our life that's what it's like exactly you know, I, I was... and yeah, no, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I was it's quite, it's quite interesting. I was actually bumped out of um, state news tomorrow morning on the IPCC, something we had planned for quite a long time because of the war. And of course, the war is terrible, but but you're so right, George. I mean, now, now is the time to recognize that we live in this interconnected, social, environmental, globalized world where, where we simply have to, you know, keep two existential threats in the air at the same time. And as we all know, this is a war that is, you know, fueled by funding mm -hmm. for gas and oil. And it's quite, quite stunning, just the numbers. I mean, Russia is the second largest gas producer in the world. It, it 70% of the imports of natural gas into the European Union comes from Russia. 50% of its economy is fossil fuels. And, and of course, um, it, in my mind, it, it just shows you know, how broken the global system is in terms of, you know, our geopolitical system, but it also shows how much we win if we phase out fossil fuels really fast, making us independent and in harmony with the planet can actually, you know, push us much faster also towards, a, you know, better chances of peace. So there's, there's something interconnected here also that, that I feel makes it, makes it doubly unacceptable in a way that the IPCC report kind of drops entirely off the media attention. I think that's the scary thing for me because you guys mentioned that all your life it's been like this where it's like warnings and warnings and the climate crisis being swept away and you know as someone who's relatively new in the climate movement it's scary for me especially because in the Philippines we are seeing the impacts of the climate crisis and so every word every digit every statistic in the report has an attached memory and experience and fear for me because I know how those numbers will look or are already looking. And yet again, the media kind of portrays it as something that's a far off problem. That's something that's only coming in the future and not something that we have to worry about today. And it's interesting to see how, as Johan already mentioned, the language of the IPCC report is becoming sharper. And I think it's a reflection of the grassroots movements and people across the world coming together more and more. But yet again, it's been swept away and people are forgetting to see the connection of what you guys mentioned, how it is a fossil fuel um, fuel war. And it, a lot of conflicts across the world are actually because of the fossil fuel industry. And that's something that we really need to tackle and show that, as you mentioned, Johan, it is that systemic problem of the fossil fuel industry and how we keep prioritizing profit. And what's interesting to me and what gives me a little bit hope of hope with the IPCC report is how they explicitly mentioned colonialism and other socioeconomic issues such as marginalization and inequity as a key factor in vulnerability. And I think that that recognition is so important and I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. I, I mean, something very striking at the, um, at the Glasgow um, COP26 talks was, um, well, first of all, the massive contrast between the energy of the streets and the sort of rather eerie, detached um, sort of space station feel of, 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 of the conference itself, but also on the streets, the way in which it was people such as yourselves, the, the, the leaders from the global south who were really coming to the fore. And I really felt that something had changed, that that, that, that the sort of people like me were at last stepping back and allowing the, the leaders from the global south to come forward and be the leaders of the global movement, which is what's been essential all this time. But uh, we've kind of shaded you out, to be honest. That, that's, that, that's the truth of it. And, and it's wrong. It's profoundly wrong. And that itself is an element of colonialism. But 
you know, we've known for a very long time that it's the poorer parts of the world which will get and are getting hit first and worst by climate breakdown and the, the countries most responsible for it which get hit last and least. And so the voices we should be hearing um, are fundamentally above all the voices of the global south. And, and we can't be an effective movement unless we are a climate justice movement. Um, and, and climate justice, of course, um, means um, those voices being at the fore, but it also means massive transfers of, of resources, and it means an end to neo-colonial practices of sort of dumping our CO2 effectively on other nations while we, in, in the rich world, um, um, make phenomenal amounts of money by burning fossil fuels and, um, and powering all the other processes um, including the extraction of, of resources from, from poorer nations. Um, it's by no means just about handing over um, a, a bit more climate finance. Um, it's, it's about really a fundamental change to the global economy. And unfortunately, that's just not on the official table at all at the moment. I, I, I must admit that one, one thing that I felt was very misunderstood in Glasgow is, you know, India announced quite early in, in, in negotiations that they, you know, commit to a net zero pathway. I mean, scientifically too late, landing 2070, but that was remarkable. It was something that was unexpected that, that India, which has almost always rightly claimed its, its right to continue gradually increasing emissions, because they have per capita levels that are so low and that they have not contributed to the to the historic problems, you know, this whole discussion, but we're seeing large developing countries accepting that we're all sitting in the same boat, we're sharing, sharing the same atmosphere and that it's, a, a, you know, a transformative moment. And then two days later, they get hammered because they don't accept the writing of phasing out fossil fuels, they want to phase down fossil fuels not recognizing that, you know, India has, has accepted to go zero carbon in, in basically 40 years time and in an economy that, you know, is growing so fast population wise, they have to lift people out of poverty and they have over 50% of energy sources from, from fossil fuels. So this is a major, major problem, of course, but, but to, to, to hammer them down because they are not willing to just uh, phase out fossil fuels overnight, I think is, is really unfair. One should rather say it is, it is such a contribution that India, as, 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 the, as the largest developing country in the world today in terms of, of growth, both in demography and, and economy, is now willing to really decarbonize and do that fast. And they need help for that and should, and should be a recipient of major investments rather than being... Uh, you know, kind of um, put as a scapegoat in, in, in the final, final stretch of, of Glasgow. And so that, that's, I, I also see this as, as one of the big dilemmas we have. And, uh, and we know that uh, the subsidy numbers for fossil fuels with direct and indirect subsidies are at the level of trillion US dollars. And we're not even able to fill with 100 billion the green, the, the, the climate, uh, the green climate fund. Which, which of course is, is pathetic. I mean, it's, a, it's an embarrassment for, for the world because if we had had the money, it would give the credit strength for Nigeria and Burkina Faso and, and all the other countries to more rapidly transition over to, to renewable energy systems. Today, they cannot do it, not because the technologies are not there, but because they don't have the credit worthiness to get low interest rate to their to take the loans required for that investment. So it's, a, it's, it's something that we need to really work on very hard also in, in COP27 in, in Egypt, which will be of course a lot focused on, on equity. There was a sense of betrayal that, that I felt while at COP26 because you know, once again, the global South, India became the villain of the story. When you look at it, if India was asking for climate finance, and then they were told that 
no, we can't give you that. The, the mechanisms that were supposed to be for loss and damages and fund transfer became a dialogue um, blocked by countries like the US. And then the US goes and says, oh, India, you're a bad person for not transitioning fast enough. And I think that that's something that we have to look at and, and analyze because I remember when the final text came out, a lot of people were really angry at India and we have to like really interrogate where that anger is coming from also because obviously behind what mainstream media was showing, there were these things where, again, the global North countries, they were blocking a lot of things for climate finance. And as George mentioned, that climate finance, it's, it's barely a drop in the bucket, but we can't even do that, right? Um, and leading up to COP27 in Egypt, loss and damages and the adaptation are topics that are being talked about a lot right now. So um, maybe you guys want to give a very short explanation of what loss and damages are and what, how, why these two things are so important, especially in our topics today and with relation to the IPCC report. Yeah, I can kick, kick that off um, briefly. I mean, the, the, the loss and damage part of the climate negotiations is one of the most important, but also one of the most sensitive, one of those parts that have been lagging behind actually after the Paris Agreement in 2015, we were still not, not, not made the home run on, on loss and damage. This is of course the agenda that is, that is one could argue most important for, for developing countries in the world because they are most affected due to the climate damages so far and have caused the least of the global warming and, and, and the, and the global heating. So therefore, the loss and damage is, is an attempt of trying to uh, get rightful compensation for losses and damages, climate impacts occurring uh, both at short and long term. And of course, this is very complex because we have long term impacts that are so damaging to the point that you can talk of, of existential risks. I mean, you have whole nation states at risk of uh, of disappearing and you have large coastal zones at um, you know at very high probability going to over the next 50 years to be basically non-livable regions for for hundreds of millions of people so it's a it's it's not an easy agenda to to handle of course but it's a really central one so it's about the compensation for those who are you could call the victims of unavoidable global warming of course, as soon as you start to look closely at the loss and damage agenda, you see that, well, actually, a lot of this can't possibly be compensated. Money, no. money can't make up for what people are losing already, including their lives, of course. And, and, and so it, it should really focus everyone's minds on just what we are facing here. You, know, you can you can give people a mountain of money, but you know if their homes have been swept away, if, if their lives have been swept away, that's not going to make any difference. Of course, it's desperate. It's absolutely essential that compensation is paid, but the, the compensation isn't compensation. It can't compensate for, for for the losses which are being inflicted and will be massively greater unless we have this urgent decarbonization program where where we we transform our economies at the sort of speed with which the us transformed its economy when it entered the second world war and it's it, one of the great ironies and paradoxes of the situation we face is that so just as we've come to know over the past three or four decades just how urgent and and essential this issue is just how it threatens everything we know and love, all our hopes, all our dreams, um, just uh, can, can vanish in the face of, of climate breakdown, is the period in which governments kind of washed, have washed their hands of governing and said, oh, you know, we can't do anything. We have to leave it to the market. Um, who are we? We're only the government. What can we do? And there's this can't do culture, which has spread around the world. It's called neoliberalism, where, where it basically says that governments shouldn't engage they, they 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 shouldn't drive change they should just step back and get out of the way whereas we urgently need government intervention we need governments to direct change to direct this great transition and and when they do they can um, act with extraordinary speed and effectiveness 
And so what we saw on the 8th of December 1941, well, we didn't actually see it, but what happened um, on the day that, that the US joined the Second World War was, you know, the, the starting gun was fired for this total shift. And within about three months, the US had switched from being a largely civilian economy to a largely military economy. You had teams of men going into the vast car plants in Detroit and jackhammering this huge equipment out of the ground. And within weeks, it was replaced with equipment, turning out fighter planes, turning out tanks, turning out missiles and rifles and all, all the equipment they needed. Um, between 1942 and 1945, the US federal government spent more money than it did between 1789 and 1941. So when today they say, oh, what can we do? There's no money. You know, it'll take years to install these new technologies to replace the old ones. That's just nonsense. It's just complete garbage because when they want to do it, they can do it. And they have done it in the past, even in situations where we didn't have digitization and just-in-time delivery and all the things that we have today, which should make it even faster. We could turn it around in no time at all, but what's missing is not the money, it's not the technology, it's the political will. That has been the crucial missing element. You know, the, just to, I mean, to give some numbers, I mean, most science shows that, you know, something like one, two trillion US dollars per year directed immediately at climate action, which is, you know, like two, three percent of global GDP would be enough to just turn the clock and really move us along the, the cutting emissions by half every decade path that we need. So we're not talking magic. I mean, the, the COVID recovery money on the table is in the order of 15 trillion US dollars already today. So, you know, we can mobilize money when, when we need and we can do it fast. And just to tie back on, on the loss and damage, just to also say from my side how much I agree with you, George, that we are making a big mistake on the loss and damage agenda, that even though it's, it's, it's absolutely necessary, it is, it is quite, quite frankly a, a very, you know, um, potentially dangerous agenda in the sense that it gives the rich nations in the world, this, this uh, uh, free ride of, of, of buying themselves out for the responsibility of damage, which is way beyond monetary values. I mean, you can never compensate the loss of a nation. And, and that is such a complete disaster that I would say that there are, you know, absolute red lines in the sand. And then one of them I would suggest being that, that there is no right to, to fundamentally undermine, uh, you know, livelihoods for, for full societies. I mean, that's simply just a beyond, beyond the, the moral acceptable thresholds in, in the world today. I mean, nobody would accept that the UK suddenly uh, would disappear under, under sea level rise. So, so we are in a, it's, it's a delicate agenda. One has to kind of play it very carefully that on the one hand, yes, compensation is needed. But on the other hand, there are kind of red lines beyond which we cannot be allowed to go. And we are unfortunately moving towards those red lines very rapidly. So, so that's again, an argument for the rapid turnaround. Exactly. I don't think it should be a scapegoat. That's the difficulty. I think, you know, you can see how fast they act if they have something to profit off of it or if they're benefiting from it. Um, and you can see that they'll do absolutely everything they can to maintain this system and to maintain this status quo that something at, such as climate compensation and reparations can be used against the people who need it. Um, and that's why it's so important, I think, when we talk about reparations that we're clear that it's not just about climate finance, it's also about technology transfer and policy change. And like, it's just one part of the climate action that's needed. It's just, you know, I feel like they're always saying, oh, we're doing emission cuts. Why are you asking for reparations? Oh, oh, we'll give you money. And then they won't do the emission cuts. And it's not, a choice. It's not you just pick one thing that you do. They're supposed to do everything. And I guess moving forward from this conversation, I feel like a lot of people, especially with the IPCC report and seeing everything happening in the world right now and seeing how world leaders continuously just ignore like willful ignorance really of what is happening to people across the world and to their own people sometimes 
how do you guys keep going? Because I know for sure that if we lose hope, that's what the fossil fuel industry in the global North countries and the governments want, right? They want us to lose hope so that we stop fighting back, but we know that we have to keep fighting back. So how do you guys hold on to that hope and keep fighting? What do you think we need now more than ever? There's no question. It is difficult. It really is. You know, we have two massive challenges, all of us involved in this, which on the one hand, it's like, you know, what are the technical things? What are the political and economic things which need to be done to pull ourselves out of this death spiral? And the other challenge is how do we sustain ourselves psychologically, emotionally, while we confront this, this unprecedented threat to, to the life of human beings and indeed to many of the other species which are extant today? How do we cope with it? And, and you know, for years, I, I realize I've been practicing a kind of splitting, you know, there, there's sort of one part of my mind which thinks about these issues and intellectualizes them and puts them into that box where it's kind of safe. Um, I mean, it's not sort of, you know, I don't feel comfortable in it, but but I can sort of detach that from my emotional life and 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 try to rationalize it and say, okay, so this is step one and this is step two and I'm going to write an article now um, looking at this particular issue and I'm going to uh, attach all the references to it and do it all nicely and send it off to the editors. And, and then there's this whole other side of me, which is, as a father, with two children, thinking, what have I done? What, I brought two children into this world and you know I've no idea what that world is going to be like when they reach adulthood. Um, I, as as someone who sees so many of the things that I love now severely imperiled and in some cases already disappearing and and it's it's just it's really hard I mean I find the danger is now for me is that the two sides are coming together I can't keep them apart anymore they, they they're sort of almost inexorably converging and that means that I'm I am finding it harder to sustain myself and and harder to to, to stay in this the, the temptation to to run away and hide from it becomes greater every year I'm not going to do that but it's it gets, it gets harder to resist yeah let, let, let me connect where you end there then George and then but but actually share with you uh, also Mitzi two let's say two two positive sides that I actually uh, feel genuinely I don't say it just as some kind of personal therapy but I, I really observe and I think is, is at least helping helping me and I think helping many many in the academic community as well but number one I mean it, it sounds terrible to say it but but one reason for hope is that we're starting to feel the pain across the entire world and and this is actually a necessity. I mean, I've been living in this frustration, and I know that you shared as well, George, that we talk about climate change. Uh, slowly but surely, people have accepted that we're causing it, but we're causing it sometime in the future, and we're causing it certainly. It's the it's the poor African farmers that are affected. It's far, far away, and it's far in the future, and now it's coming to home. It's hitting the flash floods in Germany. The 49.6 degrees Celsius in Lytton that then burned down two weeks later because of the drought. It's hitting every corner of the planet and it's hurting also the, the rich north, if we put it simple. And, and I think this is, this is something which is starting to sink in this sense of unease. You don't understand any, everything, but something is kind of freaking out in, in, in the whole climate system. And I think that is why the European Union today, for example, is actually moving quite quite decisively forward. But the second uh, window for hope is, you know, just just to share with you, Mitzi, that myself and, and and many with me for several years actually were wondering where are the youth, where 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 are they? I mean, how can it be that they are not rising for this tremendous injustice? How how can they accept that we, the adults in power today, will be handing over a, a less livable planet to you guys and, and, and you in the 80s and in the 90s were actually quite silent. Why were we worried? Because we had opinion polls 
running by Yale University, for example, for a very long time, showing time and time again that roughly 70%, 70% of citizens in the US, in China, in India, across the European nations are trusting science, are deeply worried about climate change and want climate action. And still we saw no action. So when the Fridays for Future kind of you know, erupted in this volcanic global uprising in 2018, many of us sat back and said, finally, here you are. And moreover, it's just the beginning. Because we knew that you, you didn't come from nowhere. It, it was not only Greta alone, uh, wakening up a morning. Oh no, you were, you were so well uh, you know, charged up, knowledgeable, and ready to run. So it's not a surprise at all to me that this has overnight become a global movement because it was just to ignite, it was ready to burn. And I think to me, that's, that's one big light in the tunnel. I think we both share that, George and I, that since Paris, you know, you talk to a business leader today, in almost any sector, you'll find business leaders that have positioned the climate change not as, a, as, a, as an environmental moral responsibility, you know, they place it in the boardroom. They place it as a competitive edge in their business model. So we started to see more, you know, significantly larger share of society recognizing that change is needed. And then the third and final, which is the most important one actually, is that when I started as a, as a student uh, doing studies on sustainability, it was still an environmental agenda. It was very much about protecting, reducing environmental impact. It was about basically pushing humans away from conserving nature. Today, sustainability is to a much larger extent the path to success, the path to security, the path to health, the path even to peace, the path to equity. It's, it's kind of, there, there's a new um, reboot of what we mean by the whole journey to, to a net zero future, to a, to a harmonious relationship with planet Earth. And of course, we're not there. Of course, we're battling this every day. But I, I think we have some interesting joker cards in our back pocket that I did not have 20 years ago. And one of them is success. Another one is security. Another one is health. Another one is more jobs in the economy if we do this right. And, and for the first time, we can, we can have a conversation around this, not only by being rhetoric, but actually having some empirical evidence. Wind and solar have been doubling every 5.5 years for the past 15 years. If we continue the current pace, business as usual, we will have 50%, 50% of electricity from renewable energy by, third, by 2050. You know, just by continuing as today. Of course, it's not obvious we'll succeed with that, but it's, not, it's no longer a fantasy. Like the, 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 the clean energy future is, is actually possible. And, and it's not so many years ago, we could not say that. So, you know, it's, it's really worth hanging in there. At, at least that's my view. I think people are finally starting to realize what um, the colonizers tried to take away from us, that we are part of biodiversity and we're not separate from nature and that we need nature to survive. And regarding like energy usage, I think it's so important that when we talk about just transitions and renewable energy, we also talk about how we consume energy in the first place, right? Because one fear that I have is that sure, we'll have a less warm world with renewable energy, but then the consumption and the production that's happening is still at the same rate. And, and what will happen to the minerals that you need to create these renewable energy and the um, lands that you'll have to take from people to have these solar farms and these wind um, turbines. So I think there's a lot to talk about, but I definitely agree that there is also a lot to be hopeful for. Um, for me, whenever I am feeling like my climate anxiety at its peak, I always go back to the same thing that you guys said. It's that community that you can be with, that, that you see us growing um, and not just the youth climate movement for me, but really you see more and more people caring, more and more people seeing the intersections with all the different socioeconomic crises across the world. and just you know, having conversations like these help me kind of keep going because I see how it is a multi-sectoral intergenerational struggle. And I don't feel betray as betrayed by the adults or the older generation because I see people who do care. It's just a very specific set of adults who you know have caused this. And it, it almost makes me feel like 
this fight has continued and will continue and will only get stronger until we are able to change the world. Um, that I think is so inspiring. And I think that's what we really need to focus on. Um, with that, is there any last words that you guys want to say to everyone? Please, Mitzi and, and all youth activists, keep up your great work. And, and I always say this today when, um, you know, it was also in, in, in the film, Don't Look Up, you know, this, this uh, classic question to the scientist. So what are the solutions? <laughs> as, as if the scientists solve everything. And, and my answer is today, look here, the scientist should be a scientist. You should be a concerned youth activist. George, you should be the wonderful author and, and a debate master that you are. We're, and we need to hold hands. And we are holding hands increasingly. And we're holding hands increasingly with business, increasingly with policy, of course, with civil society. And I think that when we, it's when we hold hands and, and respect each other that we can really, really push this forward. So, I mean, it's, um, it's, and, and, and I agree with you, Mitzi, that, that keeps, you, keeps you floating as well. As you both know so well, every successful movement is an ecosystem and, and it makes use of a very wide range of skills. And, and, and I get people saying, well, I don't want to sit in the road. Um, I'm not that sort of person. And you say, that's fine. That's great. Some people are really good at sitting in the road. And that's where the, their courage lies. That's, that, that's, that's what they're prepared to do. But you know, we also need radical accountants and radical administrators and radical lawyers and 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 a, a whole infrastructure to make a movement work and and we draw upon the scientists we 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 we, we, we use their fantastic invaluable documentation uh, forecasts uh, the, the, all, all that work which shows what the situation is and then we pick that up and bring all our different skills to bear on that and you know, I come in as a writer and and, and journalist and um, stuff, but you know, and and, and uh, others, Mitzi, come in as activists, and others come in as the people who sort of glue it all together. And there are loads of roles, hundreds of different roles within this, and and every single person on earth can play a part in it, and and should and must. I feel like so many people think that activists are only people in the streets. But for me, it's anyone and everyone who's doing what they can to make change. And that's really what we're doing here today. Like everyone is just trying to change the world for the better. And, and that sounds so cheesy, but that really all that it is, the fight for a world where no one is left behind, the fight for a world where we don't have to be afraid of, you know, typhoons or fires or droughts or war even. Um, and so, yeah, I just really want to thank you both for joining me today for this crucial conversation and to thank everyone who tuned in today. And if you guys have any questions for George or Johan, then please send them to the CCAG team on any of the social media channels. See you soon. Thank you.